the city of Charleston has stepped up its enforcement of their mask ordinance. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with Dan Riccio of the city of Charleston's Livability and Tourism Department for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. And Riccio, welcome back to the award-winning Quentin's Close-Ups. How are you doing today, Quentin? Oh, I'm doing great here in Mount Pleasant. Uh, I, I know that obviously you are the uh, director of the city of Charleston's livability and tourism department. Who is Dan Riccio right now? Dan Riccio is primarily focused on mask enforcement. However, we're still getting our normal duties accomplished with uh, personnel that we have. So uh, obviously with COVID, it's a very serious, serious situation and the entire world is affected by it. So we have been tasked with enforcing a mask ordinance within the city of Charleston that requires anybody accessing the public right-of-ways or anybody entering a building accessible by the public, they must wear a mask. So at this point, we are enforcing the mask ordinance. We are patrolling areas of the city. Um, we are coming in contact with people and explaining to them that there is a mask ordinance. We have put signage throughout the entire city. We have uh, message boards, electronic message boards, uh, one on Morrison Drive, one on King Street at this point, advising people that this is, you know, a, this is a mandate. Yeah, as and a that's primary, yeah, primarily our focus now. Oh yeah, and I'm sorry, so sorry about the delay in the Wi-Fi, but I know that Wi-Fi News says that Charleston uh, Tourism Livability Officers and obviously the Charleston Police teamed up to issue a total of 47 citations to anyone that spotted on the city sidewalks who were not wearing any uh, face shielding or face masks. Uh, those citations add up to nearly 5,000 impossible fines. Let me ask you, Dan, how many citations got up to 5,000 so far? Um, I haven't heard the 5000 It's $500 fine for masks. Excuse me. Excuse me. 500 yeah. Not 5000 500 uh, We have seen a couple of repeat offenders, and uh, they have um, uh, been issued that ticket with $500. It's not very many. Uh, usually people get it the first time after they receive a citation. But um, the 47 tickets they're talking about was our first day of, of our... Uh, uh, what we refer to as saturation detail with our teams of officers going out and enforcing the ordinance. And that was a total of 47 that day. And I believe it was um, a little over 60 the following day. And it was uh, over 100 count um, at that point. Now, who gets the money from all of these fines? Well, these are court-imposed fines. Um, you still have the court process to where uh, you have administrative costs and um, the fines are basically divvied up, paying for the court system. And a, a little bit of the proceeds would go back into the general fund of the city. And what is that general fund right now, Mr. BTU? Well, general fund is a, is a fund that the city has through our budget and finance department. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, an account to where um, any of the departments that may need resources that are not currently budgeted can um, request monies from the general fund to accomplish what goals they're trying to. Now, let me ask you this. What resources does your particular department have that you really can't get budgeted right now? Oh no, we're we're budgeted. We're fine. There's there's no um, problems with with our uh, manpower. Uh, there is a hiring freeze within the city. Right. Um, we are not budgetary constraints. Um, we are uh, continuing our daily duties of code enforcement, tourism enforcement, and and uh, serving the community as well without throughout the neighborhoods. So. Um, we have uh, resources available. We're not asking for more resources. We're not asking from the general fund. That is a fund that is set up for these types of citations that are issued. Now, what is the general fund balance right now in the city? I could not tell you. That would be a budget and finance question. So I do not know. 
No worries. And let me ask you this. So how many total numbers of tickets are really employees of downtown businesses versus citizens and tourists? That's a good question. Um, I would say a total, I can tell you that the total count for businesses and um, citizens is 549 to date. To date. Um, we, I would venture to say about 33 to 35 of those are directly to a business. Now, en encompassing with the citizens, that could be employees as well of some businesses. So we, we track it just as um, a general uh, issuance of citations. We do uh, separate bars and restaurants. Why? We've had an up, uptick in complaints. You've seen the media, seen the news, um, complaining about there's not enough enforcement at night in, in the entertainment district. So that's uh, our, our focus now. So, um, yeah, that's what uh, we're taking care of. Now, how many of those repeat offenders, as far as businesses, have you actually had to issue, obviously, a citation to? A couple of businesses have re reached up to four citations. Um, right off the top of my head, I know there are two bars. Uh, uh, I, I don't want right. to name them right. right now, but there are two uh, uh, bar establishments uh, where their employees were not wearing masks on each visit that my officers went to inspect. Okay. And let me ask you this. You, you talk about obviously tracking, you know, certain locations and whatnot, and obviously businesses. What is your breakdown of where the tickets were actually written? Well, um, we break it down um, basically peninsula, and then we have off peninsula. And that's, uh, we just keep a basic spreadsheet that uh, we tally uh, at the end of each day. We add to that spreadsheet. So, um, if someone requests a specific nomenclature, then we can simply go to that master list and pull those uh, to a separate file and give them the accurate numbers of whatever particular nomenclature they're asking for. Now, you talked earlier about obviously off the peninsula and whatnot. How many citations have there been on James, John's Island, West Ashley? I would probably say about 30, if I had to guess. Uh, we get... You know, it's a different animal between downtown and the suburbs. Um, when the officers go to the suburbs of James, John's, Daniels, and West Ashley, it's really strip malls and uh, big box stores. So what my officers do uh, is they basically monitor the site of the uh, parking lots. They'll drive through. But honestly, a lot of compliance is on the outskirts. Most other violations seem to be downtown, uh, primarily in the central business district uh, with citizens and tourists uh, visiting, um, not wanting to wear a mask. Now, let me ask you this too. Uh, can, does the city think people are much more willing to comply with just a friendly reminder? I know that obviously you all had this, you know, the reminders earlier last year, but can that happen now still? Not at this point. It's it's beyond um, our education and awareness and warnings. Um, people have been extremely argumentative and cursing our officers, myself included. Uh, they call our office uh, cursing um, our our process for enforcement. Uh, they don't believe in. The, the mask ordinance. But here's the thing what people need to think about. You may not like the seatbelt law, as an example, but if you don't wear your seatbelt and you're stopped by the police, you get a ticket. You don't like the law, but it is a law and you abide by that law. There's no difference here. This ordinance was enacted by city council. It is a law. It's, it's um, not something that Dan Riccio went out and said, I'm going to start enforcing the mask. No, this is an ordinance that our department has been tasked with enforcing, just like any other law on any books. 
within the city, the state, or whatever have you. But it's a it's a law, it's an ordinance, and people have to realize you may not respect the person that is giving you a ticket, but you have to respect the fact that a, a governmental body uh, uh, agreed to this law for the protection of all the citizens. And and I not might. Obviously, we know this might be a redundant question, but why does the city need to pretend penalize people to avoid them, actually make them protect themselves? Well, you have to have a consequence for your action. You, if you just go up there and you have people, oh, give them a break, give them a break, nobody would be wearing masks. So um, just like the seatbelt law, are you going to stop them each time and say, oh, don't worry about it, um, you're okay. They're going to not wear their seatbelts. You're going to have an uptick of, of uh, lack of wearing seatbelts. Same with the masks. If you don't have a component in place that brings awareness, the awareness being money out of your pocket, that's the message that has to be sent. That that's the penalty. Now, you talked earlier, obviously, about, you know, you all have already, it's been, it's gone beyond friendly reminders because of education and whatnot. Let me ask you, Dan, uh, how, how has the rate of infection going up amongst workers in those certain businesses after this mask mandate? That's something I have not calculated myself. That would be our emergency management department that handles any type of statistics uh, with the, uh, the, the COVID uh, virus. So I would not have that answer. Now, I, I probably asked you this earlier, but there's <laughs> so much going on under this bridge here. But how many warnings have actually been given out since from the time, say, from June of 2020 to right now, 2021? Well, all the warnings were verbal. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't track a lot of those two individuals. We've tracked them for any complaint that came in a business. Uh, I would say well over 100 or more warnings were given. Uh, uh, for example, I have one officer assigned to basically funnel all complaints that come into us. And uh, that's our reactive uh, approach. Uh, we we receive a complaint just like any other complaint with livability. And we follow up on that complaint. It could be something that uh, when the officer gets there, he doesn't see anybody actually uh, in violation, but a citizen did at that time, but we were not present. So we just follow up we, with the, um, usually the businesses and uh, make sure they have proper signage and make sure that they're, you know, have some procedures in place at their establishment to have and mandate that the citizens and patrons are wearing masks. Now, how many complaints have you been getting since last year? I'll be honest with you, I would say close to 200 uh, complaints at this point. Um, a lot of them do come in. People are concerned for their own safety. They uh, are afraid to go back to the place they, they go to every day for groceries. Uh, they, 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 they want the city to intervene and ensure that the management is taking precautions so that they can go and shop at this establishment without the worry of knowing somebody doesn't have a mask on. Now, how are you enforcing the mask policies at groceries and pharmacies? Well, I'll tell you, it's, um, it's a little different based on, you have two parts of that uh, for businesses. It is the city's duty to enforce the employees who are not wearing masks and the patrons. So in a sense, we could go into a restaurant or store and issue a citation. The uh, stores or uh, establishments, businesses, they're required to have signage and a process in place um, requiring their patrons, but there is no enforcement uh, mechanism on the part of the employee. That's our job. Now, I know Channel 4 reported, uh, obviously, enforcement officers cited 51 people on last Friday night and, of course, 47 people Super Bowl Sunday. And you say that your primary focus is, as you mentioned earlier, the right-of-way spots. What are those spots in downtown Charleston? Well, that would be um, anywhere there's a, a, at night, which since there's a lot of people out there, the people are drinking, uh, downtown King Street, the market, 
some, do you have some establishments on Calhoun Street, wherever there's a drinking establishment that brings a crowd and uh, uh, the potential for people to um, traverse the city streets without wearing them. Yeah, and I know that Channel 5 also reported that six officers were obviously dedicated to the uh, effort on Sunday night. Four of them were from tourism department, and as you know, the other two from the police department. How did the tourism department approach the citizens, and how did the police department approach them? The, the police are there simply as a backup for okay. us. Um, we take the primary lead. We make the initial contact. Um, if we come into a situation where the person's very argumentative, and become to come disorderly, the officer will intervene and advise them that that's not going to be tolerated. To please comply with with livability and tourism regarding the issue at hand. Now, obviously, I, I got to go back to your uh, background in law enforcement. As you know, South Carolina does not have a stop and, and identify statute. And from my research, livability code enforcers are not sworn law enforcement officials. So, how can they initiate a Terry stop or an investigation detention? Well, we have the same rights as a, uh, wouldn't say exactly what police officers have, but we have the authority to approach people and ask for identification. Um, we don't have police sworn powers, but we do have to investigate cases regarding primarily uh, residential and commercial sanitation. You have to approach people. You have to identify those people. You, in some cases, have to issue a summons. So we have the authority sanctioned by city council and the state of South Carolina to do so. Now, how can the city ensure that the tourism officers in uniform are actually wearing their masks when in public places as well? They better, because I'm okay. out there. <laughs> and, uh, we have to lead by example. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have been very vigilant. Um, with our internal processes and our employees. Uh, we, I mean, we, meaning our safety department, is very proactive. We have policies in place that we had to sign stating that we will wear masks in uh, our public buildings, in our own buildings, and out in public. So it's very important. Um, and um, it's, it's about leadership. I have to instill in them that you can't go out there and issue a citation for something that you yourself will uh, not abide by. I haven't had that happen or any complaints about any of my officers not wearing their masks because they take it very seriously. Now, since you all are obviously mandating masks, Dan, why aren't you all providing masks? We, we have provided masks. Okay. Okay. Uh, in our initial stage um, of, of education and awareness, Every officer carried masks with them. And if they didn't, that was our awareness phase. We were saying, hey, there's a mask ordinance. You don't have a mask, here's a mask. We handed out hundreds of masks to people. Uh, we require establishments to do the same. If no one, if, if they come into their establishment, we would hope that they would have masks at their location for the patrons that are coming in. And quite frankly, we find that that is the norm with many businesses to have masks available for their customers. Let me ask you this too, Dan, what is the current tax base of the city, say from May, 2020 to right now in 2021? I don't know that answer. You would have to ask our um, director of finance and our budget and finance director. I don't, I wouldn't have those numbers. Okay. Do you have by chance what lost revenue that the city is currently looking at right now? I don't do anything with the budget. Uh, could not speak for that budget. Uh, that's primarily the chief um, officer, for the financial officer. Okay. So I wouldn't have any of those answers. Okay. Now, I know it has been shown that cases go down when enforcement goes up. And I know you all have been issuing a lot of citations recently. What trend have you been able to detect thus far? Um, everything that our, our operations and the emergency operations uh, people do is tracked. Obviously, we get our numbers by DHEC, and we just do a comparison of the number of masks that were issued within this period of time and the reports of the um, K 
cases of COVID in the Charleston area. You know, we, we predominantly are concerned about our jurisdiction. Obviously, you have Mount Pleasant, uh, James, I mean, um, Folly Beach, Isle of Palms with their own ordinances to govern that. We are responsible for the city of Charleston. So we're looking at numbers even across the board and comparing to the numbers that, of citations that are issued. Now, as you know, in the city of Charleston, city council instituted the mask mandate, as you mentioned earlier, uh, last year, particularly July 1st of 2020. If the mask is for, why did the numbers of cases go up in late August, September, and, and it's probably going to go back up again in February? Um, well, I'll tell you, the, the, the reason for that is as we began the phase of, of enforcing the ordinance, the first stage was awareness and education. Uh, we, we, in our day-to-day -day encounters with people, we uh, felt the need that there were some obstacles in the current ordinance that made it difficult to actually enforce and to write these tickets. One being a, a small fine, um, people didn't take it seriously. Uh, the second one was the uh, warning phase. Uh, it was, we were being redundant with the warning face. That was hampering our enforcement process. Then you had a clause in the exception at the beginning of the, uh, the first ordinance, I should say, that allowed a person to wear a mask in public if they were by themselves. That wasn't working. That was hampering because who's, who's supposed to wear a mask and who's not? A single person is supposed to socially distance, um, the perception was he's violating the ordinance when in fact, at that time in that ordinance, he was not, or she was not. So we omitted or had amended uh, the ordinance to have every person in the public wear a mask. So there's no way that there be uh, a misconception of, well, that person's uh, violating the ordinance. Uh, because they didn't have a mask on. So uh, over time, it's, it's almost like uh, starting a new project. You have to revisit if you're having issues along the way that are hampering your progress, okay? You identify those, those issues um, that I just named, and you tweak it, and you tweak it to where it gets to a point to where um, it goes smoothly. We're at that point. We've ironed out the bugs. We are enforcing uh, in numbers now with enforcement. And you will see an increase in fines, and you have uh, seen an increase in enforcement. Now, should the number of cases continue to drop? Um, yes, I agree. And that's our focus. You know, I tell people, the best code enforcement day is writing nobody a ticket. That's how we measure success. We don't measure success by issuing tickets to people. That means they're not doing what they're supposed to do. If everybody did what they were supposed to do and we didn't have to write a ticket, Dan Riccio would be one happy man. But unfortunately, you have a lot of different views out there. A lot of people have different views regarding the masks and find it, um, some people find it offensive that we have to, uh, issue a citation or enforce this mask ordinance. It, we're just in a, an environment now that it's it's um, it's it's a lot of animosity out there with uh, the laws. Now, what is your view then on medical exemptions? Well, the medical exemptions, I, I believe, I did not write the ordinance, right. so I speak on the fact that um, the lawyers uh, drafted it that way in case. Anybody had, an, you know, a religious belief or medical belief. Um, so what we normally do if someone says, because the first thing people say, they'll, they'll, they'll start shouting out the exemptions. I've, I've got a medical excuse or a medical issue. And we don't ask them what the medical issue is. We, uh, we give them a summons and have them come to court. And if, if they produce a doctor's note that they are uh, exempt from wearing the mask, then the case is dismissed. If they don't have proof to show us that they have a medical condition, it's difficult 
to uh, not enforce it. Now, have you had anybody who produced uh, obviously that those type of documents before the we've citation? Had, okay, we've had a few people come to court. They had a doctor's excuse saying they had some form of asthma or whatever. I don't remember exactly, but the the, the judge takes all that in consideration. Now, uh, I know that obviously you all have stepped up the enforcement around downtown. Uh, let me ask you this. What are the uh, numbers, obviously, for COVID right now in, in Charleston, particularly downtown? Uh, I haven't looked today, I know, but I can tell you after a meeting earlier, just the the the, the talk within the, the meeting was that they're, they're going down. The COVID cases are going down. Uh, and we're trending better in Charleston than a lot of cities around South Carolina. So to get the exact numbers, I would have to reach out to Tracy McKee. She is our um, uh, chief innovation officer that, that handles all the, the matrix and statistics. And um, she would be the one to give you exact numbers. But just in conversation with meetings is the, the numbers of COVID cases are trending lower in Charleston area. Now, with the enforcement, is this going to scare locals and tourists from patronizing business that they actually need business right now? Well, I, you know, I, I, the intent is not to do that. The intent is to make sure that this virus doesn't spread. So that's kind of a difficult answer or question to answer because um, it's, it's incumbent upon everyone. It's incumbent upon hotels that receive their guests. It's incumbent upon the, the visitor center when guests come in and say, I'm here to Char come to Charleston, what do I do, where to go? That's a point in time where they could say, hey, there's a mask ordinance in place. Please wear a mask. So we're relying on all these to assist us in getting the message across. We don't want to interrupt anybody's good time in Charleston. They're vacationing. They're uh, shopping. That's the last thing we want to do. But the, there are laws in place that have to be enforced. This is very different from anything we've ever dealt with is the mask ordinance. So uh, it's ever evolving, you know? It's just the, the whole process, ever evolving. Now, let me go back to the courts to, and let me ask you a fair question. How can you prepare yourself for a class action lawsuit against the city? Well, um, that's not my bailiwick. The, the attorneys uh, in our corporate counsel are responsible for that. Um, so they would have to answer that question. Now, are, are, I, I know obviously the big talk around the country right now is about double masses. Are people in Charleston going to have to double up uh, due to CDC guidelines? Well, whatever CDC recommends, um, we are not going to enforce whether they have two masks on. We, it's nearly wearing a face covering or a mask is what we're going to be concerned about. Um, so... The other message I want to get across and people are using as an excuse is I've had the vaccine. I don't need to wear a mask. That's not true. That just because you're vaccinated, that's, there's no guarantee at this point you won't spread that disease to anybody else if you are the virus. So that is not an accepted uh, uh, exception for the ordinance. Dan Riccio, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to the award-winning Quintus Close-Ups. Thank you, buddy. You have a good one, Glenn. Likewise. Sure. Yeah, thank you.